mentioned that this is largely organized by the center administrators. And I particularly want to thank Liz Leverenz, our administrator, for making this happen. Um, I think everybody knows the talks are on YouTube. And so uh, for those who can't listen in live time Zoom, um, you can refer to YouTube to listen to these talks that are presented today. So I'm going to be introducing the two speakers. They're going to have 20 minutes to talk. There'll be a 10 minute Q&A session. And we believe we have the ability to extend that Q&A session beyond five o'clock. We should end at five, but if there are lingering questions, um, you can ask them through the Q&A option. Our first speaker is Mitch O'Connell. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. Mitch obtained his PhD degree from the University of Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. And then he did postdoctoral work with Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley. He uh, joined the, uh, now I can see myself. He joined the University of Rochester in 2017. And he works on biochemical mechanisms of RNA mediated gene regulation uh, through RNA targeting CRISPR tool development. So I'd like to turn this over to uh, Mitch. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Okay, I think I have the right presentation. Uh, so thanks very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. Um, it's been a great uh, online seminar series. I really enjoyed it. Um, so Lynn gave a really nice introduction telling you all about um, uh, the work that we do in the lab. And so this is kind of divided between understanding kind of fundamental concepts of RNA biology and particularly recently we've become interested in how RNA modification, certain RNA modification enzymes are uh, recruited to uh, RNA sequences and, and the role of adapter proteins and, and partitioning that kind of function. Um, but what I'm going to talk more about today is some of our previous work on understanding CRISPR-Cas, uh, RNA targeting CRISPR-Cas systems and um, not only their enzymology and how they work in their native context, but also being able to develop them as tools to uh, interrogate RNA function. And for some reason, my slides aren't changing. Not that good. Uh, so by way of introduction, we're going to focus on CRISPR-Cas13 today and um, some of that work. And uh, I'm just going to, to orient you, take you a little bit through CRISPR-Cas background. Um, and so CRISPR-Cas immune systems, as many of you probably know now, use small RNAs to mount an adaptive immune response uh, against mobile genetic elements such as phage and uh, plasmids and other uh, selfish DNA or RNA elements. Uh, the, the way that these systems work is you have this CRISPR locus that is uh, formed by these repeat arrays that are often interspaced with uh, spaces that contain uh, matches to viral or mobile genetic DNA. And closely located by in the locus are these CRISPR associated genes um, that uh, help elicit this immune function. And the way this works is you have transcription of the pre CRISPR RNA, oftentimes forming this uh, pre CRISPR RNA uh, that's this long non coding RNA. This either gets processed by host factors uh, uh, or dedicated CRISPR uh, enzymes from this. Uh, Cas operon uh, to form mature CRISPR RNAs that then go on um, to form ribonuclear complexes with either single polypeptides or in some cases multi subunit complexes that then are competent to uh, to search through an exogenous nucleic acid within the cell and upon sufficient base pairing complementarity. Uh, uh, depending on the system, either degrade the DNA or the RNA that they're bound to. Um, in order for this to work, there needs to be an upstream kind of uh, process that's carried out by a dedicated complex uh, Cas1 and Cas2. It's an integration, uh, integrase, that is able to surveil the, the cell and, and um, uh, introduce new DNA into this pre-spill locus, acting as this immunological memory. 
Now these CRISPR systems come in many shapes and forms uh, from very elaborate class one CRISPR systems that contain large multi subunit complexes that carry out this interference. So this uh, nucleic acid targeting and degradation mechanism. And then you have the much more abbreviated class two systems uh, that usually use a single polypeptide to carry out this targeting function. And for us, uh, I've been long interested uh, way back in, uh, during my PhD in, in generating programmable RNA targeting tools. And so I saw CRISPR as a new opportunity to explore um, ability to target RNA in a secret specific manner. So there are multiple ways that this could be achieved using either type three systems from class one system um, or uh, Cas9 from class two. In previous work, we're able to show that we can kind of trick Cas9 to target RNA, but more recently we've become really excited about Cas13. And the reason we're excited about targeting RNA is the ability to manipulate many gene regulatory processes in the cell um, that I've listed here. Uh, so one could imagine degrading RNA using an active nuclease that can site specifically cut RNA. And indeed, this has been used um, recently with Cas13 and appears to be a, a, a more specific tool compared to RNAi in a number of organisms. Um, work still ongoing to make that more broadly applicable. Um, uh, one can also knock out these active sites and generate um, effectively designer RNA binding proteins that are programmable. One can make fusion proteins with various other effector domains to modulate many aspects of RNA biology. So we're excited about kind of the broad potential for new abilities to interrogate RNA. And so <clears throat> thinking more about Cas13, I'm gonna tell you about some of the work that I did during my postdoc initially. Um, and then uh, more recent work that happened during my transition to my independent position at University of Rochester um, on how Cas13 works as an RNA targeting enzyme. And so we really first got interested to, in this uh, when uh, Eugene Kunin and Feng Zheng's group uh, published this collaborative uh, report on um, their uh, process in able, uh, sorry, uh, they published this report on um, using a new method to really expand what was known about class two CRISPR proteins. And what uh, a particular uh, discovery um, really uh, excited us, and this was uh, Cas13, or at the time it was tentatively called C2C2. And what was interesting about this enzyme is um, it had domain-like structures that weren't, hadn't been seen in other class two CRISPR enzymes before. So Cas9 and, and CPF1 or Cas12 had these RUB-C domains and these H and H nucleases in Cas9, for example, but for, for Cas13, it had none of those elements but contained these two HEPN motifs. And so HEPN motifs had been well uh, kind of established in other uh, enzymes as kind of bona fide RNases that are able to cleave RNA in both prokaryotic and other eukaryotic enzymes. And so we got excited by the possibility that this might be an RNA targeting uh, CRISPR effector protein. And so looking more into this open reading frame and the CRISPR system that surrounded it, we had two kind of major questions going in. Um, given the lack of any canonical CRISPR processing enzymes, so these systems didn't seem to have a Cas6, or any evidence of tracer RNAs that are required by other systems to carry out processing, how does Cas13 obtain mature CRISPR RNAs? Um, and if it's able to obtain mature CRISPR RNAs, does Cas13 bind and cleave target RNA? And how, if so, is it a mechanism where it's making a single cut in an RNA, much like Cas9 does, or is it uh, death by a thousand cuts, uh, and is the RNA being shredded by this enzyme? So those are the kind of questions we had going in. And in order to uh, tackle this, we took a biochemical approach. So I teamed up with uh, two graduate students spearheaded by Alex uh, Soletsky, um, Alex East um, Soletsky, um, uh, where we purified several different versions of orthologs of Cas13 from a, a, a couple of different bacterial species. And the first experiment we were really excited to uh, try, one of the first experiments we did 
was uh, just to simply mix uh, a pre-CRISPR RNA that had been radio labeled with uh, a purified protein and just ask the question, um, is A, the protein able to bind the RNA? Uh, and indeed it was, but uh, was anything else actually happening? And in an experiment where we just radio labeled this RNA and ran out a denaturing page, RNA gel, we were able to show um, very specific cleavage of the pre-CRISPR RNA into a mature form. And indeed, it, it, we were able to map these sites to single regions upstream of the repeat part of the CRISPR uh, RNA. And so this is where the hairpin is here. And depending on which orthologue we looked at, we saw slightly different uh, uh, sizes of products, suggesting that there's some uh, evolutionary diversity in these systems. So with this in hand, we had this mature kind of binary complex. What I should mention is that this is a single turnover enzymatic reaction. And so the, the, the CRISPR RNA remains product bound. And the next question for us was, uh, is it an active programmable nuclease? So we have this guide RNA bound. Um, and in one experiment, we can take a uh, radio labeled target RNA and just ask the question, yeah, uh, it, uh, with complementarity to the guide RNA, uh, is it able to um, be cleaved? And indeed, we saw this very interesting result that was quite a rapid degradation of the RNA. And as time uh, increased in the, uh, the reaction, we saw smaller and smaller products forming, suggesting it was cleaving closer and closer to the five prime end, at least of, in terms of what we could observe. And so through a number of experiments, we kind of explored this. And one control that we came across that gave us a really surprising result was uh, uh, an experiment where instead of uh, uh, labeling the target RNA, you label a non-target that bears no complementarity to the guide RNA. And you ask the question, when you add a, a, a target RNA that does bear complementarity that isn't labeled, so you won't see it in this gel, do you still see RNA cleavage? And the surprising answer was yes. Um, as long as this enzyme's activated, we saw cleavage of any, pretty much any other RNA that we threw in the test tube. And just as a control, this experiment can be reversed where you reverse the, the RNA showing that it's a, a pretty sequence independent effect. And so that kind of came as, gave us the conclusion that these kind of separate RNA cleavage reactions could be occurring, whether the cleavage was in cis with the on, the on target RNA or could be potentially happening like this. We haven't ruled this out. Uh, or uh, this alternative kind of uh, uh, cleavage reaction carried out by the same nuclease active site where the activating RNA is able to activate the nuclease and you get really robust non-target RNA cleavage just through the, uh, the activation of the nuclease. And I'll, I'll explain why this is, uh, occurs um, through some data in a moment. And this result was also, I'd just like to emphasize, uh, shown by, another, by Feng Zhang's lab around the same time uh, with their first uh, published uh, Cas13 paper. Um, and so it was exciting to see that uh, it wasn't uh, just a funky result we uh, had um, observed, but actually occurs in other uh, Cas13 orthologs and is actually uh, conserved right across the whole Cas13 uh, tree. And so the next question was, we have these two very distinct nuclease activities. We have this very specific uh, pre-CRISPR RNA processing that's happening at a, a single location. Then we have this kind of shredding target RNA uh, cleavage. And the question for us was, which parts of the protein are responsible for this? And so we had these HEPN1 and HEPN2 domains that were well-defined. Uh, what I didn't mention before is that these uh, are well known in all other uh, HEPN-containing proteins to form dimers. Um, Bet between two HEPN domains and the active sites, actually the interface between the two dimer dimers. And our potential hypothesis here was either that uh, the protein was dimerizing and we saw no evidence for that, or the alternative hypothesis is that they are forming an intramolecular dimer in, in 3D space and, and are confirmationally controlled. So long story short, um, what we were able to show is that there was a single residue outside of these regions that was actually responsible, uh, somehow responsible for the catalytic activity of the, the, the CRISPR RNA processing. So you can take wild type uh, protein, you get really nice processing of the pre-CRISPR RNA. Any mutations to HEPN domain one or two, or both of them, uh, doesn't affect CRISPR RNA processing at all. 
And a single point mutation right at the C terminus here uh, is able to completely abrogate processing. And what I should know is we couldn't really find any conserved elements across the tree. So it was very hard to define this nuclease. And it's an interesting evolutionary insight into the, the kind of de novo evolution of a nuclease uh, active site. And we had to make a ton of mutations across the whole protein to find a single residue that was able to knock out this activity. So that was a lot of fun work. Um, and as this field has emerged, there's been a, a number of cryo-EM and crystal structures uh, of these enzymes. And we were excited to see when the first one came out of LBU Cas13 bound to its guide RNA that the, the HEPN active site forms this kind of intramolecular dimer. Um, probably not the best term to describe it, but this, uh, where it forms an interface between these two HEPN domains. And the active site for the pre-CRISPR RNA processing is actually in a separate cleft that's formed between the back end of HEPN2 and helical one And that explains the kind of separation of nuclease activities. And so with all of this, we can come with a, a, a model um, with all the work that we've done and other groups um, where you have this apoprotein, we have this inactive HEPN domain, the nuclease uh, active site isn't in the correct conformation. You get binding of a, a, a guide RNA, you get this conformational change, but the HEPN is still inactive. And it's only upon target RNA uh, binding that you get a subtle conformational change within the HEPN active site. The two domains slide across each other to form this very solvent exposed uh, uh, HEPN active site that's capable of both cleaving in cysts and in trans. And what I'd like to really emphasize is that this active site is kind of far away from the guide target RNA duplex. This is quite different from what we see with something like Cas9 that has two active sites facing in and really cutting in between the duplex, uh, uh, the target strand and the guide here. And so that was quite interesting to us. And that explains some of its biological activity too. And so thinking about this more uh, in, in a more detailed way, we wanted to understand what were the base pairing requirements for both stable RNA binding and nuclease activation of this, of this enzyme. And so we, at the time, decided to focus on Cas13A. Uh, to date, I'd like to note that there's been a huge explosion in the types of Cas13 systems out there, and they're now subdivided into uh, three different sub, uh, four different subtypes, um, and there's probably more on the way. Um, and they all have uh, very similar properties in the most cases, and there's some interesting differences as well. Um, and so moving forward, our question was, if you just design simple experiments where you make mismatches between target RNA and a guide across the length, uh, how does that affect the binding affinity of uh, Cas13 for its target? Um, at the time, we had no idea uh, which regions were most important for stable RNA binding. Um, but what we did know from our uh, work that we had done and, and, and a number of other groups at the time is that there were regions within the guide and the target RNA that were hypersensitive to mismatches in terms of nuclease activation. So if you're looking at the end product, which is cleavage um, of the target RNA, these regions were most important depending on the system. Um, and so our question was, um, uh, how to mismatch it between guide RNA and target RNA effect nuclease activation, and can we pass that out from, guide, uh, from target RNA binding? So, in other words, is there additional proofreading behind stable binding of target RNA that gates nuclease uh, activation? And we were inspired by this kind of proofreading idea from previous uh, work on other class two CRISPR-Cas systems. So it's well known that Cas9 is able to bind a lot of targets uh, with, with pretty high kind of stable affinity, um, but it's additional base pairing requirements uh, from the distal end of the PAM that really gate the conformational change in the nuclease. Um, and so there's a differential specificity between binding stably and actually cutting targets. And perhaps even more classically, you can look at argonaut proteins. And there's been a, a lot of work in understanding the difference between uh, what's sufficient for microRNA activity versus uh, kind of siRNA and slicer activities. And in really kind of uh, beautiful biochemistry paper from Phil Zamor's group, um, there was an interesting result, particularly for mouse, mouse argonaut, where you can get incredibly tight binding even it, without complete base pair complementarity between the guide and the target. Um, and in some cases, potentially even tighter binding than a full, full RNA duplex, but none of these are competent for the eventual slicer activity. So there's an interesting decoupling here. 
And so just summarizing our questions were, the stable binding of target RNA result in nuclease activation? And if not, can we identify regions that specifically gate this? And so uh, towards the end of my postdoc and as I was transitioning to Rochester, I teamed up with Arche in the lab to develop a, uh, a high throughput method for uh, uh, determining binding RNA binding specificity. And this is just a, a a riff on the classic kind of CLEX approach, um, but using deep sequencing. And so Arche was kind of the powerhouse doing a lot of the bioinformatics and, and library design behind this. And just in short, basically we take purified protein and purified RNA that's been randomized across the target region. And we did a, a doping strategy to end up with between one and three mismatches per randomized library. And then we basically put it in an in vitro binding experiment and we elute the, the sequences that are, um, uh, that are more enriched and, and wash away the ones that don't bind quite as tightly. And we did this with two different libraries, one as an on target and one as an off target to uh, get a sense for what the background was in our experiment. This, these enzymes are a little bit sticky in our hands. And so just jumping straight to the data, here we're looking at pairwise mismatches. So looking at just a subset of uh, reads that we uh, saw in the library that had two mismatches away from our target sequence. And we saw, we're just focusing, there's a lot going on um, in this figure, but we're just kind of focusing on this region where in blue we see where uh, mismatches have the largest effect on the defect on binding affinity. So what was interesting is that mismatches in this region either paired with a, a mismatch close by or even a mismatch outside the target region in a flanking region had a large uh, defect. So suggesting that a single mismatch in this region was probably sufficient for the large drop. But when paired with other mismatches outside this region, you saw somewhat of a rescue effect. It was very subtle, but we wanted to explore this a little bit more. It was an interesting result. So we turned back to our, uh, a simple RNA biochemistry experiment, in this case, a uh, a filter binding experiment. And here I'm just showing two mismatch targets uh, between five and eight uh, um, relative to the guide RNA sequence and, and nine and 12. And what we noticed was some very different effects depending on where the mismatches were. And so if you just plot this as relative uh, apparent binding affinity between these different targets, we actually noticed for mismatches between a a uh, guide regions five to eight actually resulted in no loss in affinity and perhaps a, a, a gain in affinity relative to a completely complementary sequence. On the other hand, um, if we just move upstream in that region that we were interested in on the previous slide a little bit more, we see that uh, uh, mismatches in this region lead to 10 to a, even a complete loss of binding affinity across two different targets. And so we explored this a little more broadly on a couple of other different targets. Um, and generally this uh, phenomenon held true. Um, the idea that uh, four consecutive mismatches in this region uh, rather surprisingly was able to actually boost the affinity. And this seemed to be somewhat sequence independent. And so we have the mismatches in, in the binding assay here and here is the, the completely complementary target. So you can see that they're binding and more tightly in this case. And so we're following this up more rigorously now, but it's kind of an interesting um, observation that we saw. Now the question is, this RNA with the, these four consecutive mismatches binds extremely tightly to the target, uh, to the Cas13 uh, guide RNA complex, but does it activate nuclease, um, the, the nuclease activity? And so to do that, we had previously developed an RNA detection assay that is now uh, has now been uh, co-opted for uh, detecting COVID by a number of groups, which has been quite exciting. But for, in our cases, we use it as a, uh, in, in these experiments, as a way to um, read out nuclease activation. So we can add unlabeled target RNAs, and then we can add these short fluorescent reporters that contain a fluorophore and a quencher. And if the nuclease is active, we see a large increase in fluorescence. So it enables us to rapidly screen through a, a range of targets um, using a plate reader. And so for this experiment, I just want to draw your attention to the, this uh, guide region five to eight again. Um, 
as I showed you on the previous slide, it binds extremely tightly to uh, the complex, but uh, in this experiment, we see ab absolutely no uh, RNA cleavage um, activity. And this is in contrast to mismatches across other regions. And so thinking about this um, and looking at the crystal structures and, and EM structures that are available, what we noticed is this region between five to eight is in contact with this helix and uh, another part of the protein that seems to be directly sensing the geometry of this uh, target guide duplex. And um, we also noticed that this, this helix here is in pretty close proximity to the active site and maybe transducing the shape of this, uh, the, the duplex here uh, in order to enact a conformational change in the HEPN domains. And maybe the interesting results we've seen are due to a really high energy barrier to get this uh, uh, nuclease to activate to avoid spurious self-targeting. And so we come up with the model um, and, and this is all published um, uh, that, that basically says that this region between five to eight seems to be what is uh, sensed by the protein to activate the, the uh, nuclease conformational change and, and nuclease activity and, um, and interestingly binds the protein quite tightly. Um, and so thinking about this in terms of application of both biology, this has uh, enabled better target uh, site selection and design for RNA binding applications. So in, in, in my opinion, uh, I think we need slightly different rules for RNA cleavage applications versus RNA binding, just due to the, the differential specificity needs of the two different uh, activities that we're using here and the, the promiscuity associated with uh, protein binding. And another interesting uh, effort uh, that could be made is uh, in protein engineering to, uh, to play around with this region to uh, determine more specific Cas13 binders. Um, and this is stuff we're thinking about in the lab. In terms of bacterial immunity, is there a role for tight RNA binding but not RNA cleavage? Very similar to what we see for siRNAs versus microRNAs for Argonaut, or is it more simply just an evolutionary quirk uh, to create a high energy barrier for self to prevent self-RNA cleavage from spurious activation. Um, and what I should mention in these systems, um, and I'll talk about this in our conclusions, that natively Cas13 acts as an exo-RNA sentinel that when activated results in global host degradation, cell dormancy. I didn't really touch upon this, but uh, many groups are now shown in, in, in host organisms that when this guy gets activated, uh, the cell basically shuts down because all the RNA within the cell not all the RNA, but a majority of important RNA at least gets cleaved and the cell goes into dormancy. Um, and this is a very uh, commonly used phenomenon in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes upon viral infection. And what I also told you about is that Cas13 is a dual RNAs um, that has both this very specific pre-CRISP RNA processing and this general non-specific RNAs that is activated by a specific RNA. And these are very different in both the enzymology and uh, their, their cleavage patterns. Um, and finally, with our more recent work that much like Cas9 and other nucleic acid guided complexes, such as the Argonauts, uh, Cas13 exhibits decoupled RNA binding and cleavage specificities. And there's a role for particular sensing of particular base pairs within that target uh, guide RNA duplex that are required to enact the conformational change required for activity. And so, to quickly finish, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my current lab who are continuing up and on a lot of this work. We're pretty excited to, to make some gains and hopefully have some uh, new interesting data for you soon. Uh, all the people in the Doudna lab that I collaborated with on these projects, um, various mentors past and present, um, funding sources and um, this conference series for letting me speak. And I will finish with that and try and take questions. Great, thank you, Mitch. Uh, so we're essentially, out oh, question. So we have two questions. Is there a strategy to reduce trans SSRNA cleavage by Cas13, since this is a concern when using this tool for targeting a specific RNA of interest? Yeah, I, uh, this is something we've thought about a lot. Um, it's the same active site that's doing cis versus trans. One could imagine maybe reducing the affinity of the active site for RNA that you need a very high local concentration. So kind of pushing for cis activity. Uh, no one's really tried to attempt that, at least that I know of, um, but that could be an interesting mechanism. 
as it turns out, um, what happens in eukaryotic cells uh, in 99% in of the reports, um, there isn't none of this collateral cleavage and no one really knows why. We have a few hypotheses and I'd be happy to talk about them offline, but um, it's an interesting phenomenon. So it works really well in eukaryotes without trans cleavage. Um, and we have some, some ideas why. Another question is, is it clear why some bacteria use the Cas9 system cleaving only the target while others use Cas13 and thus uh, shutting down their I own? I mean, that's a, a, a very big qu question in the field that we don't have a great answer to. These Cas13 systems are incredibly rare compared to Cas9. And I mean, the type one systems are by far the most uh, predominant and they seem extremely efficient. Um, it might be due to local environment. Um, a lot of these live in, in communities, so there might be some benefit of that. It, I think the evolutionary questions of that at the population level haven't really been answered. So I don't have a good answer. Okay. We have one more question, but we need to stay on time. So I'm sure Mitch is getting other questions. I think we need to stay on time. So uh, you have two more questions. I'm sure Mitch is going to answer them. Um, yeah. And we'll move on to our second speaker. Okay. So our second speaker is Shin Li, who is an associate professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the University of Rochester. He also has an appointment in urology. He earned his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at Cornell University in Ithaca, and then did postdoctoral work at UMass Medical Center with Phil Zamor. Uh, he joined the U of R in 2014. His lab studies epigenetic inheritance via germline RNA in both the mouse and the chicken. And he is going to be talking about coupled protein synthesis and ribosome guided pi RNA processing on mRNAs. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay. Yes. So uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the project today. So this one is a new uh, project in the lab. It's the first time I present it. So I would appreciate any feedback on that. So our lab study uh, pyRNAs. And the pyRNAs uh, have many unique features compared to other small RNA like microRNAs. So first, the uh, pyRNA is uh, longer. Uh, they are also loaded to a special clade of uh, argonaut protein, which is a PV protein. And their 3 prime end have a massive modification on them. So in vertebrae, the pyrene is almost exclusively expressed in the germline. And the evolutionary pyrene only has been detected in animals. So one of the well-known functions for pyrene is to silence the transposon. So they can guide the PV protein to uh, silence the transposons through base pair complementarity. So, and this pyrene actually the main function of the pyrene in uh, Drosophila and the zebrafish are to silence the transposon because most of the majority of the pyrenees is coming from the TE. However, the situation in mammals are more complicated. There are three class, three class of the pyrenees in mammal based on where they come from. So there are pyrene from the transposable elements and TE pyrene coming from long non-coding RNAs and also pyrene from the three prime UTR of mRNAs. So developmentally, so the uh, in mammals, so TE pyrenees are expressed uh, in the germline in the uh, primordial germ cells, so in the embryonic stage. So well, the uh, link RNA, so RNA from the long non-coding RNAs are turned on during the uh, packaging stage of meiosis. So they're also known as the packaging RNAs. Well, supreme UTR RNAs, so they expressed after birth, but before the packaging stage. So they're also known as a pre-packaging pyrenees. But this definition is a kind of uh, arbitrary, so I will revisit uh, this part later. So regarding uh, the evolutionally, so this kind of almost all the pyrenees 
So the, the TE mapping pioneers exist in almost all the animals. So that essential, make them, so make them essential for their fertility. And then, but the packaging pioneer so far has been only found in mammals. And three prime UTR pyrenees, um has been detected from Drosophila to mice. So functionally, the TE pyrenees to silence are uh, transposable elements. So they are essential to maintain the germline genome integrity. So the packaging pyrenees function, so is they can silence mRNA. And uh, so those mRNA are essential for sperm maturation. However, the function for the three prime UTR pyrene is not known. So regarding the biogenesis, so the TE pyrene, once they cleave their target, their target could also become a pyrene and come back to generate more um, anti-TE pyrene. So they form an amplification loop called the ping-pong amplification loop. Also, pyrene could be produced, TE pyrene could be produced through a phased mechanism. So this is uh, what I mean by uh, phased mechanism. So basically, the pyrene are produced from long single strand precursor, and the cleavage, endonuclease cleavage occurs stepwise from five prime to three prime. And the cleavage generated the three prime end of the previous pyrene and the five prime end of the next pyrene. And of course, the three prime end of the pyrene usually have need to be further matured and trim by trimming and then have a two prime or muscle add to them. So this process is called the phase the biogenesis. For link RNA, so there uh, for the packaging pyrene. So they don't have too much ping pong going on because most of the uh, uh, pioneer from them are uniquely mapping to the genome. So they generate also are produced through a phased mechanism. And also there seems additional requirement. So like, so people, Chen Lab has reported there's a TDRD5 required for the uh, packaging pioneer biogenesis. And our recent work show that the ribosome also involved in the packaging pyrene biogenesis. So, so this is the model picture from our, my entire assistant professors, uh, professorship's work. I'm going to guide you through uh, this uh, model, what we found in the passing five years. So basically, uh, the packaging pyrene was uh, transcribed, was activated, this synthesis is uh, activated by the transcription factor AMIP. And their precursors have the GCAP and poly A. And their uh, fragmentation processing requires a helicase, uh, mountain L1, and also PLD6, which localized on the outer membrane of mitochondria. So it is uh, endonuclease RNAs. So then those two act together to uh, generate a phased uh, pyrene. So what we found is that, so the ribosome actually guide these uh, endonucleotic cleavage. So ribosome actually was able to translate the short open reading frame near, uh, near the five prime cap. And with the help of mountain L1, the ribosome actually migrate to the downstream region and the guide the pyrene biogenesis. So, I, so this short open reading frame actually separate the long non-coding RNA to two separate parts. In the later part, they require TDRD5 to produce a pyrene. Before that, they do not require TDRD5. Uh, for their uh, to produce a pyrene. And the uh, ribosome only required to guide the biogenesis uh, at the, after the u off, not at the u off or before u off. So this model actually opened multiple questions. 
first is that does it has to be like a U of short operating frame? We know there is a, from the study of the U of in the mRNA five prime UTR, we know that the U of the short the length of the U of is important because so the initiation factors do have not uh, released for after you just uh, translate a short operating frame. So that allows ribosome to reinitiate at the main off. So is that a similar mechanism that the ribosome got used here to when they, uh, after the uh, U-off? We don't know that. And another question is that, so what is the translation status of the ribosome downstream off? Because this is a long non-coding RNA, there's frequently double codon there. How ribosome could translocate processively on them? So we still do not know. So given there's a lot unknown about packaging RNA, so we actually know nothing about the supreme UTR RNAs. So here I'm going to summarize the unknown about this RNA. So we actually do not know what to regulate them their biogenesis and their function. So first is like what regulates their expression. Second is that, so their precursor, are their precursor mRNA or there's a cryptic transcript only like uh, trans transcribed as supreme UTR. So if the precursor is mRNA, so how does the pioneer processing cooperate with the translation? And are they processed similarly as the RNA from the link RNA? And also what are the, their biological significance? Because they can be found in the, uh, from Drosophila to mouse. So, they're, they're, what, so they're, they probably have some function. So we decide to and so address this question by a subgroup of the supreme UTRNA RNA we found uh, in our molecular cell paper, reported in our molecular cell paper. So when we define packaging RNA uh, and uh, pre-packaging RNA, we find there's a group of RNA that are, have a feature in between of them. So they are also from like a similar as a pre-packaging RNA, so they come from supreme UTR. But similar, more similar to packaging RNA, they also turn on from the 14 day to 17.5 day, so which is the stage of the packaging. So we call that a hybrid RNA, but we didn't really characterize them. So we decided to use that as a, so as a, a, to, to, to understand the supreme UTR RNA. So first we want to see like whether AMIP actually regulate them. So we reanalyze our AMIP chip data and find that AMIP uh, indeed bind near the transcription start site of the promoter, mRNA promoter of a hybrid from the hybrid RNA loci, similar as the packaging RNA so precursor. And also there is a MIB consensus motif there. And in the AMIP loss of function mutant, so these, uh, the mRNA also disappeared. So this indicates that AMIP does regulate the mRNA from the hybrid RNA loci. So then we want to understand that whether these mRNA are indeed the precursor of a hybrid RNA. So we look at the smRNA data, and we find that indeed the RNA is uh, disappeared. So this correlation between the mRNA and the hybrid RNA that suggests that either these mRNA are their precursors, alternatively, the disappearing of the RNA could be due to a secondary effect. To uh, distinguish these two hypotheses, possibilities, so we decide to block uh, post-transcriptional processing of the hybrid RNA using the, um, can, we conditionally knock out the mountain L1, okay? So in the mountain L1 mutant, the hybrid RNA is completely gone, okay? 
And we find that in the uh, mutant, the mRNA from a hybrid RNA loci accumulated in the mountain R1 mutant. And also, you uh, look, uh, we look at the clip data and find the mountain R1 actually specifically bind throughout the entire transcript now of, HP, uh, so of this uh, mRNA. So all these data taken together, so rule out the possibility that the hybrid RNA come from a cryptic alternative transcript from only from the supreme UTR regions. So then we can make a summary here. So basically we found AMIP regulate the supreme UTR's um, RNA expression and the mRNA are their precursors. So then the next question is that how does RNA processing cooperate with the translation? So what we, we did the ribosome profiling and we can detect ribosome uh, at the UR, at the off of this, uh, we call that the from, so because the hybrid RNA, mRNA from hybrid RNA precursor loci, we just call that HPPL mRNAs for now. So we see that, so the, there's obvious uh, three nucleotide porosity there. And also when we calculate the translation efficiency, they have similar translation efficiency. So they indicate they are indeed uh, translated. Then we want to understand whether the translation is tightly coupled with the pioneer processing or not. But doing that, so we actually look at the two cap binding proteins. One is CPP80, one is EIF4E. CPP80 is actually a nuclear RNA, uh, cap binding protein. So basically it's uh, uh, lead to pioneer round of translation. And after that, so it's replaced by the cytosolic uh, cap binding protein EIF4E. So we find that actually um, HPPL mRNAs are significantly enriched in the CPP80IT compared to control mRNA. I want to mention that the control RNA, mRNA are selected who has the same expression dynamic as HPPL mRNA, but do not produce a RNA at all. So we also see that, so the Exon junction complex is enriched in the uh, HPPL mRNA. So indicating that, so indeed this RNA is translated by a pioneer round of translation. So to test that whether, so the lack of multi-round uh, translation is due to the RNA processing, we look at the ratio in the uh, mountain L1 mutant where we block the RNA processing so we find that all this enrichment is depleted, is gone, and they have a similar ratio as a control mRNA. So these results, also when we, we have also results showing that when we block translation, so the HPPL mRNA also got stabilized. All this suggesting that, so the translation and the RNA processing is tightly coupled. So they happen the co-translation only. So similar to other kind of like translation of dependent decay, so we check whether these kind of processing can affect the protein, steady state, the protein levels. So we did a uh, mass spec uh, with the five mutant and the five litermate control. We were able to see that the protein encoded by the HPPL mRNA show a small but significant increase compared to the, control, the protein coded by the control mRNA. So these actually bring a function of the, uh, the hybrid RNA, but not the RNA themselves, but the processing of produce the hybrid RNA, which is fine tuning the protein amount. So, and then the, the next question we have is that, so are they processed similarly as RNA from link RNA? So packaging RNA, so which are guided by ribosomes. So, so this is one example of the uh, uh, hybrid RNA gene. So this is uh, coming from EF4EBP2, which is a, a factor involved in translation. We see that uh, ribosome also go to the supreme UTR. 
And we find that the ribosome also share the same five prime end as the mature pRNA. So, and so it's been suggesting that they also guide the fragmentation process on the three prime UTR as they do for the packaging pRNA. And uh, this is uh, overlapping was not seen in the, o, in the ORF region, pRNA from on the, the uh, between RPF and the pRNA on the ORF region. And similarly, we see that the biogenesis requirement for pRNA produced from off region and from supramural UTR region is also different. One require at the supramural UTR, they require TDRD5, and at the U off, they do not require operating frame. You uh, do not require TDRD5. So therefore, like we can conclude that, so their biogenesis is also similar as a pRNA from the link RNA, so guided by ribosome, and there's a biphasic biogenesis with a different biogenesis requirement. So then we look at the transcript structure of um, these hybrid mRNA, uh, IgPPL mRNA. Very surprisingly, because normally transposable elements are depleted from axonic region, but we do see like H, uh, so the HPPL mRNA harbors more T element. So in mouse, they harbor more sign element. So they were able to generate the T pRNA. That is, so all these pRNAs, is, is they are uniquely mapping to the uh, uh, HPPL mRNA. So, and this pRNA was able to cleave other uh, transposable element in the form of ping pong, significant ping pong here. So that actually bring another function for these hybrid three prime UTR pRNA, which is they can actually silence the transposable element. So, so basically our work like systematically uh, characterize these three prime UTR pRNA so about on their regulation, their biogenesis, and their function. And uh, we also be able to propose a general biogenesis mechanism in mammals, uh, regardless of RNA source, whether they come from long non-coding RNA or from mRNA. Ribosome all play a role, and, so, and also they separate the transcript to different part, so have a different biogenic requirement. And because, so the off lens does not matter now. So that means that, so they also probably don't need to use the initiation factors that uh, on, so still associate with on the uh, ribosomes. So that probably indicates that so they must have a very special translation status at the supreme UTR. We actually have evidence indicating that there's um, a recycling and ter or termination defect of this post-termination ribosome. And the post-termination ribosome actually, um, so they guide the pine biogenesis. So I would like to thank people in my lab so this is my lab, of course, if this is before COVID, but we were able to um, find activity, lab activities uh, with the social distancing. So this is us uh, last month doing strawberry picking. Uh, I would like to thank my collaborator, uh, Imlano, and uh, also thank uh, Ji Hong, so who is a visiting student but stuck at uh, uh, China, and also thank my colleagues that like uh, including Lin, Tasaki, Dimitri, so who really um, uh, taught me a lot about the translation, and also I thank people uh, Jeremy Wang from UPenn who provide the key region to study the mountain L1. And also, I would like to send my funding from the NIH and the USDA. So we funded by USDA because we also study chicken RNA, and we actually so all these three prime UTR biogenesis 
mechanism actually is conserved in chicken. I didn't have time to show that. So, that, so I would like to conclude my talk here and uh, take questions. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Shen. You do have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, nice talk. I'm wondering whether there is a general rule of pre-pi RNA processing. In other words, can we predict which RNA transcripts or which fragments on the transcripts would be processed into mature pi RNAs? So far, we don't know. So I think this is a studio. There is not a completely random. There is some rule there, but we still do not know the rules. Okay. Another question. Why is the maximum amplitude or bulk of the three prime UTR pi RNAs generally so far downstream from the stop codon? Are you implying there is still ribosomes, some ribosomes on the three prime UTR downstream of the stop codon to stimulate pi RNA biogenesis? Yes, yes, yes. So, put an example. Okay. So you can see here. The ribosome actually go very far from the stop codon. So I want to clarify here is that, so this is not a stop codon read through mechanism because the stop re uh, codon read through, they, they just as another gRNA come to the stop codon and they were able to continue to translate. Um, but the, it's not that we, we can rule out that mechanism here. So it is, uh, I think it is a post-termination ribosome um, so we actually have evidence showing that uh, this ribosome have empty A site. Okay, so I think uh, so. In a single molecule study, have shown that a post termination ribosome actually can slide in bidirectionally on the RNA, although that has not been reported in eukaryote yet. But I think probably we have a similar mechanism here. I think it's been reported by Alan Jacobson, sliding mm. upstream of a termination codon. I don't know about downstream. Okay, another question. Uh, it's about the evolution of PUE pi RNA systems. Suppose that we integrate a novel transposable element into the mouse genome today. Will the PUE pi RNA system adapt immediately to this invasion? Will the TE transcripts be processed into pi RNAs and initiate the anti-TE response? Oh, that's a very good question. So we actually know very little about how new RNA is produced when there's, because I think it's through the evolution time, there will be the germline is constantly being invaded by new transposons. And it is a, a really important question to understand how the host can adapt to this uh, uh, using RNA to adapt to this uh, new new invasion, but I think it's uh, because evolutionally is uh, happen all the time, but it's uh, difficult to capture this moment of just a new invasion. So we did some work like uh, uh, from chicken, and we saw that in chicken recently there's a, a new uh, invasion and the. Uh, it is the, it's the endogenous retrovirus invasion, a virus in, a retrovirus invasion, and the, the virus is still infectious. So we were able to show that I think initially RNA probably is not an initial mechanism. They are initially silenced probably by DNA methylation by histone, because we shown that so uh, in the wild chicken, undomestic wild chicken, even they have this endogenous retrovirus. Uh, they do not produce a RNA against it. But uh, we show that in a domesticated chicken that uh, there's a RNA produced to silence it. Uh, and so I think uh, probably RNA do not come in, it's not an acute uh, response, but it is gradually adapted. Uh, another question is, the signs, for example, B1s, are mostly transcribed by POL3. Mm. What is the mechanism of hybrid pi RNA silencing of B1 in mice? Well, they're within exons, right? So they're POL2 transcripts. Yeah, yeah, because it's, so this is sign, sign actually got in, uh, uh, so inserted into the uh, supreme UTR. So basically they are transcribed 
by PAL2. So of course, once they become pyranate, they can target the PAL3 transcript. Okay, you're getting a lot of questions now. Okay. So I'll give you, Pong, you can ask uh, Shin in person, uh, Eric. Uh, very interesting, what controls the levels of three prime UTR pi RNA generation and how well does, does uh, pi RNA biogenesis correlate with protein suppression? Do you have a guess? as to whether the protein regulation just happens or is it biologically useful? <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that all these, those protein, uh, so if you look at what these mRNA are, so you can, you, you can tell the function. You can meet, so some of these mRNA are very familiar. So, and uh, there's a report that if you knock out them, they are lethal or something. So I think, so we don't have direct evidence showing that. So the protein, the fine toning of the protein amount is uh, is defective, but yeah, we we just assume so. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the best answer we have so far. Okay, one last question. It's not that there are no more questions, so you'll have to go on, Shin, and answer them. And it is, can you elaborate on the role of PLD6? Is the pi RNA processing associated with the mitochondrial function? Okay, okay. Okay, PLD6 is believed to be the endonucleus. Um, to fragment the pyranid precursor. However, I think we, are, we still need the direct evidence for that. Uh, so why the pyranid biogenesis is linked to mitochondrial function? Um, so I can tell you this, a lot of the pyranid processing mutant show a very uh, interesting phenotype, they show that the, mitochondria got the aggregate in one polar of the supermitocyte. So suggesting that somehow the pyranid biogenesis may be important to regulate fission and fusion of mitochondria. So, but there, is, there has not been too much study on that yet. Okay, so um, it's important, I think, to stay on time. Shin, you have a bunch of other questions, lots of questions. I want to thank everyone for listening. Um, and uh, the next RNA Collaborative Seminar is in two weeks from now, same time, different station. So thank you, everybody. And I'm sure Shin will ask, answer your questions. And if Mitch gets any more, he'll answer those too. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Yes. Bye.